The historic Third Ward of Houston, Texas lies directly southeast of downtown Houston, known for being Houston's most diverse black neighborhood. The Third Ward has a rich history deep-seated in the unity and culture of Houston's black community. The Third Ward, one of the city's original four wards established in 1839, was one of Houston's first predominantly black communities. Originally, the Fourth Ward and Freedmanstown were the main black cultural centers of the city, but the Third Ward rapidly grew in population, surpassing these areas. The population grew quickly after the Civil War era as free black slaves from surrounding counties settled into the city. Coming into the city, they were forced into the outskirts of town, most of them working as mechanics, factory workers, bus drivers, and other blue-collar jobs. You know, we had people who were porters. We had um, people who worked on the railroad. We had uh, other people who worked down at the waterfront. Uh, we, we had workers all over. We, uh, we had some people who also worked in the restaurants as waiters. The community was growing and changing quickly, and whites began to move out, fearing they were losing their jobs. This opened the opportunity for black Americans to establish neighborhoods and institutions, causing the Third War to flourish as an area in which the black community felt comfortable and connected, allowing their culture and rich history to thrive. By the 1880s, approximately 25% of black households in the Third Ward were owner-occupied. During this time period, many home styles that are still seen in the Third Ward today originated, such as the shotgun house, named because supposedly if you shot a shotgun at the back of the house, it would fire straight out the front door without hitting anything. This style of home was built as one story, one room wide, with no hallways and with doors at the front and back of the house as a cheap housing option for residents in the Third Ward at the time. This building style was very common in urban areas and big cities all across the country. Many of these houses still remain in the Third Ward today, preserved by the organization Project Row Houses, a nonprofit dedicated to the celebration of African American art and culture. Over time, the Third Ward residents began accepting government funding to establish educational facilities in the area, building their first school, the Third Ward School, in 1870. In 1885, they renamed it to the Douglas School after Frederick Douglass. One of the area's most defining strikes against the Jim Crow laws of the time was a sit-in at the lunch counter in Wine Gardens, a grocery and deli located on Almeda Road. Texas Southern University student Elderway Stearns and other school leaders organized a sit-in at the diner, known for serving blacks but not allowing them to sit at the counter with the whites. They were inspired by the famous sit-in that took place in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960. The president of Texas Southern University at the time refused to punish the students, standing with them in their fight against racism. Wine gardens ended up pulling the stools at the counter, allowing black customers to stand next to the white customers to order their food. The impact of this sit-in sparked a movement in Houston, inspiring several other sit-ins at establishments downtown, helping to end segregation in Houston nonviolently. I understand that here in Houston, we, we really, we had a, a peaceful, quiet bridge from segregation into to integration. Black churches have historically had a lot of influence in African-American communities. At a time, the Third Ward was home to more than 90 churches that stood as places of worship as well as social and civic centers. During the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, churches in Houston, much like black churches elsewhere in the South, got involved in efforts such as voter registration drives. Many churches also served as meeting places for those involved in the civil rights struggles. Dowling Street was once the heartstring of the area, a street lined by businesses owned and run by black Americans. In 1950, there were 150 black-owned stores and other businesses on Dowling Street alone. Some, such as Wolf's Department Store and Pawn Shop, still remain today. On the corner of Dowling and Elgin still stands one of the most iconic landmarks in the Third Ward, the El Dorado Ballroom. Opened in 1939, the ballroom served as a nightclub in which black culture and music was thriving. Many local blues, jazz, and R&B musicians got their start at the El Dorado, as it was a huge achievement to get to play the venue in the first place. Like many of the businesses on Dowling Street, the El Dorado Ballroom began to lose business in the early 1970s after desegregation. Even though the nightclub eventually closed, the building has been home to many other businesses over the years and was donated to Project Row Houses, who make sure to preserve it and keep that history alive. Across the street from Dowling, Emancipation Park stood as a common area in which people of the Third Ward could join together and spend time with one another. 
Emancipation Park was established in 1872 by freed black slaves who purchased the land for $800, making it a symbol of their freedom and escape. They made this purchase as a celebration of Juneteenth, a holiday celebrated on June 19th, the day the news reached Texas that the Emancipation Proclamation had freed the slaves from bondage. Juneteenth is still celebrated each year in the community, and this year as celebration, they are working on renaming Dowling Street to Emancipation Avenue. Dowling Street was originally named after Richard W. Dowling, an honored Confederate soldier. The community finds this name commemorating the racist past of the Civil War, unfitting for the street whose most prominent feature is Emancipation Park, so they are working to rename it to something more fitting. This new name will hopefully be revealed alongside the grand reopening of Emancipation Park this upcoming June after a $33 million renovation. Because of segregation, the Third Ward was a community for both wealthy and poor black Americans, all attending the same schools and churches. Everything was segregated. It was black and white. We had, we had to go to black restrooms when we went downtown. If we were on the bus, we had to sit in the, uh, on the back of the bus, where behind the back door, that was usually where uh, we sat. Also, when we went to any public event, there was always the black section or the colored section, as they called it, and it was vividly spelled out, that section with some kind of sign that said colored and white. After desegregation, those who could moved out of the Third Ward into other areas and suburbs, causing the livelihood and energy of the area to die down. As people started shopping other places, many of the successful businesses on Dowling Street closed and less investment was going into the community. Many of, of the blacks left the neighborhoods, they went into other neighborhoods, then our the homeowners, where we had homeowners' property, it became rental property, and some, some of our neighborhoods just went down, down, down. Not only that, some of our businesses also went down because people were in other areas. They didn't shop in our areas anymore. The Third Ward is not as lively and successful today as it once was. Today, more than 47% of families living in the third ward live below the poverty line. However, this percent may be much higher given that 91% of third ward children qualify for school lunch programs. Historically, black Americans in Houston had a harder time getting approved for loans and interviewed for jobs because of the color of their skin. I had become supervisor in the uh, Houston Independent School District and I had gone in to this particular school where I had been the first black supervisor to, to appear at that school. And when I walked up to the desk, here I am professionally dressed in my suit, heels, whatever, makeup, and the secretary tells me, I ask for the sign-in sheet. May I have your sign-in sheet, please? And she told me, well, the custodian sign it sheet is right over there, you may get it. And I told her, I said, ma'am, I'm sorry. I am your supervisor, I'm not your custodian. Because of the openly racist climate of the time, black Americans were able to be denied these privileges without any backlash to those being racist. Things like this, paired with the consequences of black sharecropping after the Civil War era, left the black community set back economically. These setbacks seeded an internalized racism without consequences, proved harder to recover from. Today, although racism in most places is claimed not to be tolerated, these setbacks are still prevalent and still affect black communities. Today, black men earn only 71% of what the average white man earns, despite claims of equal pay and lack of discrimination in the workplace. Black men are also underrepresented in higher wage jobs, despite having equal educations to their white counterparts. It is discrimination like this that hinders black Americans from success and keeps them in the rut of poverty. But I've also worked through like a temporary uh, labor hall, which is an agency that would uh, send people to work on a daily basis and they pay you on a daily basis as well. It's uh, like a trendy resource for people who have low income, uh, no education, no skills, or uh, stuck with addictions, or it can be a positive thing too, like people who are elderly and uh, into retirement. 
and they want to work and uh, make some extra money and stuff like that. Texas Southern University and the University of Houston both call the Third Ward home and are both major contributors to development and education in the Third Ward today. Texas Southern University was established in 1927 with the original name the Colored Junior College as one of the two junior colleges being funded in the area. Texas Southern University was established as the colored counterpart to the University of Houston. In 1934, it was approved by the Houston School Board to become a four-year university and changed the name to Houston College for Negroes. After many years of relocating and expanding, the name of the university was changed to Texas Southern University after the students petitioned to have the phrase for Negroes removed from the name. TSU holds the honor of being the first black college in Texas to have a law school. Today, the university is thriving, offering bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees in over 13 colleges and programs. Despite the collegiate excellence being showcased in the third ward, elementary through high school education is struggling. Just like the business success that once flourished on Dowling Street, Houston's third ward schools are just as affected today by their past deep-seated in racial inequality. Because of poverty in areas like the Third Ward, the schools in the area don't get nearly as much tax money to use on buying supplies and paying teachers as schools in wealthy suburban areas do. We didn't get new books the way that the white schools had new books. They gave us the books from the white schools. This economic disparity causes a huge blow to inner city school systems, leaving many kids without a successful education. The harsh reality in Houston today is that 45% of Third Ward residents don't have their high school diplomas. This leaves these residents behind on the job market, making them less employable and setting them farther back in the rut of poverty. One of the biggest battles in Houston and other large urban areas across the United States in modern times is gentrification. Many people have heard about gentrification but don't actually know what it is. In simple terms, gentrification is when wealthy people and businesses start renovating poor neighborhoods. Now this sounds like a great plan, but the reality is that renovation and restoration of these neighborhoods make them much more expensive to live in over time, causing the poor residents to have to move out. In the last decade, the Third Ward has had the largest demolition rate of any area across Harris County. However, the construction rate in the area is behind the county average. Gentrification of poor, mainly black communities in big cities typically leads to the mass construction of nice apartments and lofts that people who cannot afford the property rates downtown can buy and rent. This process pushes out the residing communities in these areas, taking their culture and rich history with them. Residents of the Third Ward have seen the tidal wave of gentrification coming for a long time and have taken steps to prevent its destructive side in the area. Garnett Coleman, a state representative whose district includes the Third Ward, has made it his responsibility to do all that he can to preserve the history and culture of the Third Ward while still encouraging development and change. Coleman worked with the Midtown Redevelopment Authority to use money set aside for housing to invest into the Third Ward instead of Midtown, where property values were already very high. The Redevelopment Authority would then sell the property to developers who could only build affordable single-family homes and rental units. Today, the authority owns three and a half million square feet of land in the Greater Third Ward, yielding many single-family homes and plans for future apartment complexes. On top of that, churches and other nonprofits in the Third Ward own one-fourth of its land and have used their platform to encourage the local culture and sense of community, crafting a vision for a neighborhood that honors its history and revives its culture. In modern times, the strength and culture of the Black community bound together has never been more important. In response to police brutality and racist acts across the country, movements like Black Lives Matter have become powerful organizations that are fighting to reach racial equality across the country while uniting and empowering Black communities in the process. Over the past two years, there have been many protests and marches throughout the Houston area in response to national and local events that threaten the equality of Black Americans. These protests have often been met with backlash by white residents who feel threatened by the movements, but nevertheless, the organizations are still fighting today. Houston is a big melting pot. And um, I think if there had not been the changes and if we didn't have what we have right now, we would have more protesting going on than we have right now.